Tonight we're talking about the Roman Republic's fall and also we'll just mention echoes of that for let's think about our 21st century perspective and experience here. Um, but specifically we want to look at tonight um, the, um, the, how the constitution of the Roman Republic worked uh, because that Republic has been the model for so many um, uh, other traditions subsequently. It's been so, uh, subsequently so important. So, for example, this picture that I used to illustrate it of the U.S. Capitol building, although the United States um, had its origins as colonies subject to the English crown, um, so that's where the background is in terms of at least the political class. Um, obviously, the people in the United States come from all over the place, uh, including indigenous people and pe uh, people who were brought as slaves from Africa, but in terms of the elite class, they're primarily descended from uh, initially back then in the colonies from the English. And the monumental architecture, however, as we see it, is not modeled on English archetypes. So you know which one that this building is? U.S. Supreme Court. Right? No demonstrators. <laughs> yeah. In <laughs> contrast to the Parliament of Canada in Ottawa, right? So this is a different um, type of revival architecture than what we're seeing in the United, in the United States in Washington, D.C. anyway. Um, the Palace of Westminster, housing the British Parliament in London, both of these are uh, architectural revivals of English, medieval English architecture, what we call Gothic architecture, Gothic revivals. Um, the Palace of Westminster, although it um, looks like a really old medieval building and has some very old components in it, um, it's largely a 19th century uh, building, uh, like, just like um, Downton Abbey. If you look at that, it's also a Gothic revival building that is from the 19th century as opposed to re a really ancient building. So instead of going that route, however, and uh, you know, delving into their own particular immediate tradition, Washington's architects were hearkening back uh, to a very different model than Gothic revival, right? And that model, of course, is Rome. Um, and this is the Forum Romanum, the ruins in the center of the um, political heart of the ancient city of Rome. You can see, anyway, through the this here back there, that's the Senate chamber. Okay, so that's not, uh, you know, building after, though, the contemporary Renaissance or medieval Rome of the popes, and specifically since, um, especially two centuries ago, America's leaders were largely anti-papal or pro-Protestant, pro -Protestant, anti-Catholic in that kind of sectarian divide. Uh, nor really are they, were they originally thinking anyway, of the imperial Rome of the Caesars and trying to emulate um, that, but they were specifically thinking of that ancient Rome, uh, the Republic that existed before the time of Caesar Augustus, right? And so that's what we want to kind of talk about tonight and go back and take a kind of close in, zero in look at how sort of the constitution of that state worked. So one of the uh, ubiquitous examples that's all around Washington <laughs> Uh, in terms of a symbol that they're definitely hearkening back to from the Roman Republic uh, is the Fasces, the symbol of the Fasces. And so those are these guys. <laughs> if you can kind of see them there, there's essentially they are sticks that ha have uh, back that are bound up uh, with a wrapping around them. And if you go to the House of Representatives, the U.S. House of Representatives, they're right there. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, inside that bundle of sticks is an axe. Yes. Uh, and this was carried before um, uh, the Roman officials to indicate the um, uh, power uh, concealed. Yes. And so you can see that on the House of uh, Representatives anyway, there's the, axe, there's the axe sticking out, right? And so um, there's a, the axes are visible on these. They are not visible on the ones that Lincoln has, <laughs> nor when we go into the Oval Office, is it visible on the ones on the, over the lintel. It's hard to see that because the, it's very washed out, but it's a fast case. <laughs> uh, okay, just as Elizabeth was just saying, the fast case, um, which is lat literally the word for bundle in Latin, 
uh, is a bundle of rods with an axe, and the axe is sometimes concealed. Um, in then that Roman Republic, magistrates um, were preceded uh, by um, their, I wrote staff here, but that's sounding conf confusing. <laughs> their staff members, you know, in other words, their employees, their ceremonial employees, a, an office called a lictor, uh, and they would be carrying these bundles. And so essentially, part of your honor guard, and your honor guard is running around carrying these lictors depending on what type of level of magistrate you are. Uh, some magistrates just had one lictor, praetors had six lictors, uh, and consuls had 12 lictors, I think, right, walking around in front of them. So this practice that the Romans had is actually inherited from the Etruscans. Uh, the Etruscans are this um, ancient people that are unrelated uh, uh, ethnically or at least um, linguistically to uh, Latins uh, that are ex lived in what we now think of as Tuscany. That's the same name, the Etruscans and Tuscans, Tuscany. And so, um, they were, however, at a certain point, more powerful and more civilized than the city of Rome, uh, and, but ultimately got absorbed by the Romans as, as Rome grew. Uh, and Romans picked up lots and lots and lots of things from the Etruscans, uh, which have therefore made it all to us, <laughs> because even though the Etruscans are very little known other than, um, uh, but because they were so influential on the Romans, lots of stuff that they did has survived to this day. So, <laughs> There are competing invocations <laughs> of this same symbol. So um, this particular uh, icon, the symbol of the Fasces, was famously revived by Mussolini. So this is the logo of the fascist revolutionary party in Italy. Uh, that was the government in the lead up to World War II. Um, and so obviously in this case, he's still talking about representing the authority of the magistrates of the Roman Republic and indeed the Roman Empire then that he felt that he was sort of reviving with his authoritarian state. And so he essentially is saying this symbol, which represents authority and power, represents imperium, what we represent as fascists is, you know, we, that we have the authority to rule. And so this is anyway, a counter use of that same heritage. And um, linguist, uh, this is a linguistic note. Anybody who has suffered from plantar fasciitis, yes, <laughs> it's the same word. Oh. But in this case, it's not a bundle of sticks with an ax inside. It's a bundle of uh, fibers, um, tendons, and, and stuff on, on the sole of your foot. And it gets inflamed and it hurts. Oh, <laughs> so same word. So one of the neat things of Latin and Greek in our <laughs> languages, they're all over the place. Okay, so one of the things we want to then explore tonight is when Rome was a republic, how did its constitution actually work? What was the republic all about? What was the structure? So what does SPQR mean? Senatus Populus. Senatus Populus Que Romanus. Senate and people of Rome. Yep, Senatus Populus Que Romanum, the Senate and, Senate and people of Rome. And so essentially, this was a shorthand, and the ancient Romans actually just wrote out that abbreviation. Um, it's a shorthand for their state, and so in a lot of ways then, as a shorthand, the Romans themselves were thinking when they thought of what does it mean to uh, have a state or when we're talking about it, um, we, it's, it involves the Senate, <laughs> involves people, uh, and it involves particularly a city. And so the Roman state is definitely, although it ultimately is a vast empire, uh, it begins as one of these competing civil city-states, uh, like the different Etruscan city-states that are, are nearby uh, it and those kind of governments. Uh, but it expands beyond that to uh, ruling an entire first peninsula of Italy and then ultimately the Western Mediterranean and the whole Mediterranean basin. So what is the, it's also called the Roman Republic. So what does the word Republic mean? You got it, it's in here, right here, right? So yeah, so the, the point here that says res publica is it also comes from the Latin, but unlike, uh, as you might be familiar with all these Latin words that we, or words from Latin that we have like revive, repurpose, reclaim, there's a bazillion words that we have that have the prefix re on the front of it, uh, which means again, right? So claim again, reclaim. So we always have those kind of um, words. Republic doesn't mean to public again, <laughs> you know. It actually means um, race public. So race is a word 
uh, in Latin, it just means thing. <laughs> so it's the public thing. <laughs> and so it was hard to, um, I guess when they're thinking about what this thing is gonna be after they overthrow their monarchy, uh, they just call it a thing. <laughs> so it's the public thing. Um, then that happens too when the, um, in the, uh, the, uh, the Icelandic parliament, right? Which is called, I think, the all thing. And so it's like, you know, the thing of us, for all of us, right? So uh, it's hard to describe what this public thing is for the ancient Romans. Okay, so just to kind of give us kind of our framework, I put a little bit of a timeline together from the eighth century before the Common Era all the way to the Common Era. So those, um, whatever, 800 years. Uh, in that first um, time period, 753, um, when we sometimes call that a, you know, a ab urbe condita, since the founding of the city, uh, it's a numbering scheme that gets used. This is a legendary foundation date. Um, so 753 is not particularly actually when Rome actually got founded. In fact, the city was there, you know, the village and stuff like that was there before that. Um, but that's when the Romans, when they started thinking about it, looked back and decided that that was when it had been founded. Um, according then to that later legend, the first king is a guy named Romulus. Uh, and you may be uh, aware of him both from you know, the uh, story of him, him and his twin brother and being suckled by a wolf and ultimately deciding who was gonna be in charge of it and him killing his brother and this kind of a thing. Or and you may be aware of Romulus because of Star Trek and the Romulans. <laughs> you know? and so anyway, there's a lot of echoes of that. Um, then there's seven uh, traditional myth, semi-mythical kings that lead up till the last king here, which is uh, whose traditional dates are 539 to 505. Uh, Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud, uh, he's overthrown and that is when then um, the Republic uh, is founded traditionally. Again, there's so still into in traditional dating as opposed to and traditional, let's say, myth stories that we have as opposed to ones that we can um, verify in any way. Uh, that's also then when the, um, at that very beginning, when the um, Romans create one of the central offices of their new uh, public thing, which is to say the consuls. We'll talk about that. Uh, a little bit uh, thereafter, a couple decades later, they create one of the other important offices, the tribunes of the plebes. Um, and then we can kind of just see then in that kind of long time period that I have marked off here as Rome and Republic, that's the time period that we're talking about. And, um, and indeed, this is not like they have one static constitution the entire time, or that their constitution is actually uh, like the US constitution, a written constitution. Uh, rather, they have um, positions that they put in place, customs and laws, and especially then traditions that evolve over the course of it. And so it also does change through the course of the Republic, but we're just gonna look, ab look at it as it um, kind of reaches its zenith or its apex um, so that we can kind of just get see how it all fits together anyway in the course of that the first while at this point here rome is really just a little city state uh, in the next uh, century half century or so it conquers this area called latium which is to say lazio the area that's right around the city of rome uh, the next century uh, as we see, it's ex they expand further, they um, fight all of their sort of neighbors and ultimately uh, dominate all of Italy. Uh, in that time period, um, we have in the year 366, the first time uh, one of the uh, Romans who's not a patrician, uh, not from the patrician class, and we'll talk about these two classes, but from the, pleb the plebeian class, uh, actually attains the, the height of power, the position of consul. So there's a level of essentially inclusiveness. The big fight between the patricians and the pre plebes happens between that, those two time periods. Um, then we see on there the Punic Wars, um, which is to say the time period when Rome is fighting with the uh, Phoenician or Punic city of Carthage for control and dominance of the Western Mediterranean. Uh, and then thereafter, um, the fights that they had with the remnants of the uh, Hellenistic, the Alexandrian empires that were dominating Greece, conquering the East and things like that. And then we'll talk about um, some of the different constitutional uh, moments, constitutional crisis moments at the end, the, the time period with the Gracchi, the fight between Marius and Sulla, 
and then the eras of the triumvirates, which is to say uh, the time period of Caesar and his rivals and his nephew Caesar Augustus and his rivals. And so we'll see how then that is, leads to the end of the uh, Republic. Yes? Can you also explain um, the difference between the Greek uh, democracy and the Roman Senate and Republic, etc.? Yeah, yeah. So we'll also, um, as we go through this, I will, although I don't have slides about it, we'll look at the, we'll look specifically at Athenian democracy and I'll just contrast it with what's going on there. Um, there are some similarities uh, with what the Romans are doing in terms of their having a, um, a republic, but it is in, in the same sense that um, you could call many of the Greek city-states that don't have kings um, republics, because the word republic is sort of, sort of vague and all-encompassing. <laughs> so, I mean, these days you can have, I mean, pretty much a republic is anything that doesn't have a king, right? So you can have any kind of a dictator or you can have, you know, a full-on participatory democracy and it could, the both could be called republics. And so by that kind of technical or whatever broad uh, uh, definition, many of the ancient Greek city-states would have been republics, although some of them, like Athens, would have been um, a much more democratic uh, republic than Rome's republic. Whereas some of the city-states like Sparta um, have actual kings, uh, although they have a bunch of other weird stuff to their constitutions, and so therefore are little tiny kingdoms. But we'll talk about, yeah, that. Okay, so we go back then to that beginning of that time period, the legendary foundation of the Republic in 509 BCE. So um, the Romans remembered that their last king anyway uh, was Lucius uh, Tarquinius Superbus, who was reigning there at the end of the sixth century. So his name then is Tarquin the Proud, and Tarquin is a Etruscan name. So their memory anyway was of a king that was um, a successor to an earlier King Tarquin, uh, and also a, a king that is potentially of foreign domination or Etruscan domination, depending on how much uh, the ancient Romans were actually a merger of Etruscan and uh, Italic peoples. Um, it's hard to exactly say. Anyway, legendarily, he's understood then to be, since he's an Etruscan, to be essentially a kind of a foreign king. Uh, after then, um, one of the causes belly of overthrowing the king. Uh, his son rapes a Roman noblewoman, Lucretia. Um, then the head of the king's bodyguard, uh, just like in Game of Thrones when the king slayer kills the mad king. <laughs> uh, Lucius Dunius Brutus leads a revolt. So he calls together a, um, a council or a big assembly of the people and he explains all of the different uh, reasons why um, the uh, king has now betrayed you know, all levels of decency and beyond the law and things like that. And that uh, assembly then votes to strip the king of his imperium, which is to say his power or authority to lead the Roman people. And so then he's expelled and exiled and he spends the rest of his life, that, queen, uh, that king, which isn't that much longer, next decade or so, uh, trying to uh, take back control of the city uh, via using interior traders and then also um, neighboring uh, kings who are helping him by supplying him with armies to attack Rome. Yeah, um, I noted that one of your themes tonight is uh, the idea of um, like a constitution and yes. I'm assuming constitutions, you know, if you're going to um, make a parallel between the, the, the ancient Roman and the American uh, are based on on law and particularly what we know as natural law. Yeah. And I'm wondering if this instance of the, you know, as you said, this, uh, you know, betraying the bounds of decency is an instance of, you know, floating what would be seen as natural law, you know, law higher than, let's say, the will and the whim of a tyrant. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, know, so I, absolutely. Yeah. Now, whether or not, you know, wh again, whether or not this is a historic, actual historical event, this is how the Romans chose to couch their memory of it. And specifically, I think. Uh, with the point that you say. So, which is to say that kings, because they have uh, uncheckable authority, or specifically these Tarquins, Tarquin the Proud, um, you know, he isn't subject to law. There's nothing anybody can do to stop him from, um, you know, even breaking down the, uh, the propriety of families, especially even in the case of noble women, um, which is, this is ultimately a noble revolt. 
So the revolt that happens here when there's that assembly called, it's not an assembly of all the common people or something like that. And the, and the rebel here, Junius Brutus, is not um, just a, a cobbler or something. <laughs> These are the people who are already parts of the nobility in the city, uh, the senatorial class, so, and the Senate already exists. But exactly as you say, so I think that they're um, looking back on that and thinking that king then equals tyranny uh, at least in the ro from the Roman perspective, from thereafter. Yes. Can you Urgent. explain a little bit the difference between the tyrant, dictator, king, emperor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what's the difference between a tyrant, a dictator, a king, and an emperor? So, um, so technically, at this time period, um, tyrant has a different meaning than what we use it for now. So all these words we have all, including prince then too, all these words have all evolved in English. So tyrant for us is specifically a monarch of some kind or actually even a dictator or anybody, anybody who wields power in a way that is really obviously unjust and cruel and that kind of thing. And that's how we understand a tyrant. Um, and that's how I'm sort of using it here <laughs> um, as opposed to in the technical sense of that time period. So for um, ancient Greeks, and it's a Greek word, the, wor the word tyrant um, originally would have meant um, someone who is uh, uh, appointed, kind of like an appointed king, who is generally speaking from outside the city. Uh, you know, or they will have picked somebody to rule them as opposed to somebody who is a hereditary king. And so one of the things that will happen is, and you have a city that has noble factional fighting, it becomes ungovernable in a, in a city-state situation. And so a lot of times then, in order to make it so that the city can actually move forward, that city will um, say, well, let's ask you know, this famous guy from another town to come in and he'll be our ruler. And so in Medi this also happens in the Renaissance, in Italy, in the Middle Ages as well, and the Italian city-states will call that person a podesta. Um, but essentially it's the same um, idea uh, and so these different tyrants of ancient Greek city-states would have been like that. Um, that's different from, so a dictator. Um, a dictator obviously has a modern connotations for us now, but we're gonna also talk about in the lecture here where the word comes from and what the technical meaning is gonna be uh, for the ancient Roman Republic. And then finally, um, um, prince and emperor. <laughs> These are titles that evolve out of the Roman Empire. So we use the word emperor now to mean kind of like a big king. And generally speaking, it would be a king of, an, of, a more, of more than one kingdom, right? So essentially, you might be a king of Germany, but you're, you know, or, or king of Prussia, but you were also emperor over the rest of Germany or something like that, or you're king of England, or it meant that you're also emperor of India, something like that. Um, whereas um, for ancient Romans, the word emperor still means, it's simply from the Latin imperator, and it just means general. And so from this time period, whenever anybody will mention here is a general, they actually have the title imperator. And so the word emperor doesn't evolve yet until after, after the existence of the Roman Empire. And so at this point, that title isn't even, doesn't exist. There will have been um, emperors from the way we use it. Um, for example, we've talked about it the contemporaneously, let's say the Persian emperor. But we're using that modern English word for that. And so the Persians would have called themselves Shah or Shahanshah or something like that, king of kings. Um, and so that would have been a, a different name at the time. Elizabeth. I think uh, Oedipus was, I think the play is called, and sometimes it's called Oedipus Rex, Oedipus the King, and sometimes it's called Oedipus Tyrannus. Oh yeah, that's right. I think. Tyrant. Because, yeah. yeah, because he was, um, uh, he came to the throne because he married the queen. Right, right, yeah. So yeah, so somebody who in that case is uh, technically is not, um, you know, like born into the, into the throne the way, like a, someone born to the purple, as we also sometimes say, maybe you don't say it, I say it, but anyway, it's, uh, that also is coming out of the, um, that is also coming out of the Roman experience. So one of the things that happens is when we jump 2,000 years back, a lot of times there's all kinds of historical developments that we have to unpack, even in our own terminology. Okay. So anyway, one of the things um, that Tarquin the Proud is known for in, in these um, legendary stories is, uh, you can see here the in a romantic painting of the guy. He's got his sword, and he's cut off all, uh, all of the tall poppies. So there's a flower bed, 
and some of the puppies have gotten too tall and he takes his sword and he just levels it so that the ones that stuck their heads up got their heads chopped off. And so he essentially was using that as an explanation to tell his son, you know, who ended up raping Lucretia <laughs> anyway, you know, that if any of the nobles, you know, stick their heads up too high, those are the ones you kill to keep the rest of them in line, right? And so, um, and so that's essentially the, the idea. Which one is Tarquin? Yeah, it's this guy with the... That's this is just like priests that are presenting him a laurel wreath or something like that. I don't really know. It's like a romantic 19th century painting, I think. Okay, so when then that happened, um, when the Romans get rid of Tarquin the Proud, they don't want to have a king anymore. And so I'm using that English word king, which wouldn't have existed back then. The Latin word is rex. And so rex regis. And so if we, um, if we think of the word regal in English, that's coming from that word. Um, so for the Romans then, this is an unjust ruler, the title rex. Uh, and so they now, um, the nobles who have now overthrown that um, king, want to avoid similar concentration of power in any one magistrate. They don't want to have a leader. They're going to be now led by civic magistrates and they don't want them to um, have that be able to be above the law like that. So they instead create a new constitutional system that deliberately separates power and also limits power by adding a whole bunch of what you know, people technical or uh, in constitutions call checks and balances, right, of, of limiting the different powers. So one of the first um, uh, separations of power that they do, uh, so the king had executive, military, legislative, and judicial powers, but the king also had a bunch of different religious powers. Um, kingship we don't always think of because we um, are also sitting at the end of a couple thousand years of separation of church and state in the West. Um, we um, don't often think of the fact that kings, kingship was often very sacred and that there was often not a lot of separation between um, priesthood and kings. Uh, and so all of the different religious um, rights uh, and sacred uh, responsibilities and titles and prerogatives and things like that that the king had um, was separated off into a, a magistrate in the uh, Roman nobility, somebody who is a patrician, who was got given the title Rex Sacrorum, which is to say sacred king, right? Uh, king of the sacred. So not, and he's not king, but he still has the title Rex, right? So he's king of sacred stuff. So to counterbalance that, that honor and all the different things that he's allowed to wear, he's allowed to wear the robes that the king used to wear on certain religious occasions. He's allowed to do the different uh, offerings and things like that that the king did. Um, in order to counterbalance that though, the Rex Sacrorum uh, in the Roman Republic was barred from all kinds of things. He couldn't hold any other political offices. He couldn't hold any military commands. And so essentially it's a dead end role. You get to be this and you get to have ceremonial and you can walk around the city and you've got one lictor who can lead, walk around in front of you. Uh, but you never, but then you get a whole bunch of things you can't do. So, you know, it's like you, you're really keeping halal and kosher here, you know, what exactly it is. But anyway, you're not allowed to, I don't know, eat onions or whatever the whole list, list of things that you're not allowed to do because you're the rex sacrorum, right? So um, the other then, the, the next magistrates are the, actually the most important ones. So much of the king's um, non-religious then executive authority, that imperium as the Romans call it, this uh, command power that they have is transferred into a new magistracy, which is to say the consuls, the consulship. The consuls lead the Senate and they also lead all of the popular assemblies of the people. Um, they're the chief civic and judicial officers and they also lead the troops. So that's a lot of the remaining kingly powers. However, to check uh, any one consul from having that power all to himself, they create two consuls uh, that can have the power to veto each other. So if you as a consul say, I am now going to lead the troops and we're going to go attack uh, Iran. Iran, yeah, there you go. <laughs> then there'd be another consul that says, I veto that. <laughs> and then they couldn't do it. And so then that can happen anyway. So generally speaking, they would take turns in terms of who was sort of taking the lead every month, one month off and one month off. But even during the time you're kind of in the lead, the other consul can always veto anything that you're doing. 
I mean, unfortunately, for I mean, at a certain point, if you two hate each other, <laughs> you have to come to some agreement, you know, that I won't veto this if you won't veto that or something like that. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, over the life of the Republic, the Romans develop an elaborate constitution with power separated into many offices and assemblies. I've created a little diagram that's going to make it very uh, easy for you to remember. <laughs> 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 I'm sure. Okay, so here it is. <laughs> this is essentially, a, not, there's a lot more to it, but this is essential structure of the Roman Republic. And so you can kind of see things that you may be familiar with. I mentioned we've already talked about the consuls, right? The Senate, the assemblies of the people, other jobs like quaestors, military tribunes, curial idols, praetors, censors, plebeian idols, plebeian tribunes, proconsuls, proprietors, dictator. So we'll talk about all of those things, <laughs> how they all work. Okay, so the assemblies. So um, this is where uh, legislation has happened, it's where the judiciary happens. So essentially, um, in the election of officers. So we have a centuriate assembly, and a tribal assembly. Um, our word tribe has, in modern times, really gotten uh, synonymous with tribes that are living in the rainforest and things like that. And so the idea of tribes in, in the Roman sense is, it just is your kind of initially your ethnic group or the area that you are all, you know, apart from your part at your neighborhood initially. Although ultimately, it's quite arbitrary what tribe you're assigned to. Um, the centuriate assembly, um, is initially, uh, if you can think of that word century and all those kind of things, centuriate, that's the word hundred. Initially, it's um, about uh, uh, all the different fighting men of the city, so the citizens who are grouped into groups of a hundred, and groups of a hundred in Rome are led by centurions, and so they're also grouped together into centuries. Those centuries then are able to vote, and that becomes the centuriate assembly. Uh, although over time, instead of having it be your century cohort and your fighting group, the grouping instead happens by uh, wealth categories. And so you take the wealthiest century, and that may only have seven people in it, and then you have the least, after a couple hundred, you have the least wealthy century, and that may have a couple thousand people in it, and every century only gets one vote. <laughs> And so at the end of the day, if, it's, if you start with your vote uh, you know, with, the, with the richest guys, then they vote three, four. <laughs> the fours carry it. That one vote there counts vastly more than the 7,000 at the end because by the time you get halfway through the voting, the thing's probably decided anyway because it starts with the richest. So anyway, the citizens, anyway, people are citizens, not uh, men who are citizens not women and not um, anybody who doesn't have citizenship, so the poorest classes and slaves, of course, are excluded, um, are involved in the Republic through the assemblies, which enact laws. They hear judicial cases and they elect the magistrates. So cons consuls and praetors, and we'll look at those magistracies, are both um, called and preside over the assemblies. So sometimes we don't think about this when we think of um, for example, the existence of Congress or the existence of the Parliament. Parliament, um, uh, it was a huge, kind of big, long fight through the Middle Ages for Parliament to get its own right to call itself into existence. <laughs> so initially, Parliament had to be called by a king in order to make it happen. Uh, the Ecumenical Council had to be called by an emperor or a pope. Uh, otherwise, the Ecumenical Council can't get together to make its thing happen. Same thing here. These. Um, Centuriate assembly and tribal assembly, that's the way you can get legislation done, but it can't simply meet all by itself. You have to have an officer with imperium, a magistrate with imperium, call it together and present it with something to vote on. Then they vote, but they don't get to dis debate, right? So uh, there, that's how that works in terms of the, the portion of the people uh, uh, d intervening. And so to Erjan's point before about how is this, and then in a republic, then different from, for example, Athenian democracy. Um, in, the, in Athens, uh, the franchise isn't that far expanded, um, but 
Um, but it is extended a lot farther than this. <laughs> and, and when the Athenians are all meeting together in their assembly, they are all able to talk and debate and, vo and vote. Um, and so then, so it's therefore a much more uh, participatory democracy. Um, this complex system must take and have a couple of hundred yes. decades of years to build. What time exactly was this complex system after use? In yes, so um, I'll, I'll have a timeline. We'll come back to a timeline and we're going to come back to um, uh, we're going to come back to my diagram and I'll be able to point it out a little bit better. Essentially some of these, a lot of these assemblies, even though there's a bunch of different assemblies, uh, they're quite old, although there are older, there's an older assembly that I've left off the diagram because it ceases to be important, and so there is evolution going on here, but um, we're trying to make a little bit of a simplified form. When I get to the big picture, I'll, I'll point out some of the things that are older or newer over time. Okay, so we'd mentioned how the Centuriate Assembly works. It initially works as your century cohort. It later works as a, as a property um, stratified assembly. The Tribal Assembly then is essentially the, every people in the city uh, in the, who are citizens are grouped into 35 different groups. And, it's, uh, and it ultimately, it originally referred to your neighborhood, but it quickly over the centuries or two just became um, like in Parliament when they had rotten boroughs, so that essentially it would be wh whichever tribe you happen to be in, uh, that's what you get to vote by. Okay, so in terms of the different officers, um, there is essentially a, a hierarchy. The Romans loved hierarchy, <laughs> and, and so they liked to also do things in, in an orderly way. And so if you were a young nobleman, uh, initially just the patricians, but later it opened up to larger, uh, and embarking on a political career, you would always stand uh, election to these one year long terms as a magistrate uh, in your own year. So at a certain year, in a, it's your 25, it's time for you to be you know, a quaestor and so on all through till your uh, year to be a consul. Um, uh, essentially starting at quaestor, going to curial idol, then praetor, then consul. So the quaestors are in charge of things like the treasury, all the finances and everything like that, and specifically doing things like going around and collecting the taxes, making sure that's all done. Uh, and that's why they have so many of them. <laughs> you definitely need that to happen. Also because a lot of those guys won't go on, right? So if you just get to that first rung and you're not going to be the, somebody who's going to ascend to the whole height of the state, you've at least done your part to keep your family noble and get in the Senate and that kind of a thing. Uh, Adels are uh, in charge of municipal services. Uh, there's only two of them, and they're a it's a very expensive office to have uh, because already back in the Roman Republic, this is a, the office where they're involved in uh, what, I mean, if you think of the, the phrase, bread and circuses. <laughs> so on the one hand, they're, they're dealing with the roads and the, uh, the sewers and all that kind of thing, but on the other hand, what they're uh, dealing with is grain distribution. So in the middle of the Republican time periods, or actually towards the end, um, at first, uh, people are, have laws where the people are able to buy grain at a discounted rate, and the uh, adels have to make sure that that grain is be able to be bought by the state so it can be sold at that discounted rate. And by the end of the Republic, um, there's simply free grain distribution for people who are authorized to get it, which is like every citizen. And so you would be, um, uh, the adel has to get the grain <laughs> in order to have it all lined up, and then anybody who wants to get it can. And so um, obviously that was necessary for all of the really poor citizens who um, didn't have access. Otherwise, you wouldn't, if you have a city of hundreds of thousands of people, you wouldn't be able to get that grain um, without the state providing it. So that's the bread part in the bread and circuses. Uh, but, but for example, very rich um, conservatives like Cato the Elder would wait in line to get his grain, <laughs> you know, his little modi, you know, his little sack of grain that he's entitled to because, you know, because he was, you know, that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, uh, so if anybody, if, if, ever the, if everybody else is getting it, he's going to get it too, right? So uh, the other part is, though, the games, right? So, you know, like of gladiatorial games, but also um, uh, circuses, which is to say horse races, uh, chariot races. They, um, uh, you would throw those as an adel uh, so that um, 
people would remember what a fancy uh, Roman holiday you had in your year as an idol, and then they would remember that and vote for you later. So it would be a way to make uh, your name in a political career. You had to be pretty rich to do it. So at a certain point, you could bankrupt yourself trying to do it, which is a lot of times why they didn't get past Queister. Okay, when you get to the higher ranks, Praetor and Consul. So they are the ones that all have this imperium power that is derived, you know, that taken from the old kings. Um, they have the power to lead armies and call the assemblies, create legislation, that sort of thing. The consuls could use these especially to pass legislation. Praetors every, every once in a while could do that depending. Uh, generally though, what they would be doing was they would use the assemblies in order to try cases. So there isn't a separation essentially of the of the judicial and the legislative because the same, uh, the same assembly of the people can be used for either purpose, but they just have to be called for the different purposes. They're both, again, one-year offices. All of these offices so far, you only are in it for one year. It's another way you limit um, power if a person is only able to be, you can't be consul for life if you're only consul uh, to be there for one year. Um, uh, they are then often extended, though, as proconsuls or pro praetors, which is to say you're still a praetor, a praetor, but you just don't get to be one in Rome. So they will make, extend your imperium and, and assign you to, let's say, um, uh, Provincia, to Provence, and then you will have, you, you essentially be the provincial governor there. And so that would be a way for you to make all that money back that you lost as an adel, because now you can just um, squeeze all the revenues out of the, out of the provincials <laughs> and, and corrupt, all kinds of other corrupt things. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, cause you're in charge of the government, you know, on behalf of the state. And so that's where they'd make their money back, um, proconsul as proconsul and pro praetors. Okay. So, um, just as going up, we've, these are things that are fairly familiar. The Senate is probably the most familiar part of the uh, Republican system. Uh, you probably have heard anyway that Senate, Senator means old man, Senex is old man. Wow. Um, and so, um, I never heard that. well anyway, like the word senile, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that's a, that's a sin, I mean, anyway, it's, it's a word that comes from the same root. Um, and so the consuls called together and presided over the Senate. In contrast to the assemblies, all the senators have the right to voice and vote. And so one of the ways that um, there's a check on anything getting done in the Roman system is if, uh, if somebody calls, if a consul calls uh, something that you don't like uh, and, you, and brings it before the Senate, um, if you have a committed enough group of uh, your faction in the Senate, every single one of you can um, say you want to speak on the topic. And then, and since the Senate has to um, stop at sundown, uh, then um, you can essentially filibuster, right? <laughs> and so the senators had the power to filibuster. Um, they do not, however, enact laws, and so this is different from how people think of a senate. Rather, they pass what's called a senatus consulta, which is to say um, they're giving advice. The senate is giving advice to the different magistrates, and so they're constantly essentially telling all the magistrates what they should be doing or how they should be doing their jobs. Technically, the magistrates don't have to do that because they are the ones that have the job. However, the magistrates almost always followed what the Senate uh, consulted them to do, um, in part because they are aware that after their one-year term of a magistracy ends, they're just going to be a senator. And if they, I mean, as much as you want to run wild on your one year, later you want to have the uh, precedent be that the power is in the hands of the Senate, which is where you're going to be, right? Generally speaking, in the course of the Republic, it, it fluctuates the number, but between three and 500 lifetime members um, are part of that Senate. Initially, um, only patrician nobles, but later it expands to the plebeian class. Okay, so just as we're talking about things like um, filibustering, <laughs> there's also then um, this ultimate check on more or less everybody's authority in the Roman Republic, which is the veto. <laughs> So the former kings had the power to veto stuff. It's just Latin for the word is just I forbid. That's what that means, uh, which could cancel anything from being done from, for example, if a magistrate makes a, some decision, you could say I veto that and then he won't be able to do it. Or be calling an assembly, for example, I'm calling the Comitia Centuriata to uh, meet. I veto that. <laughs> so then you can't meet, you know, you can't do anything. 
So the power is actually spread pretty broadly in the Republic. So the consuls, as we mentioned, can veto each other, but they can also veto anybody lower than them. And the guys lower than them can veto them lower than them, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of vetoing that can happen. Um, anyway, so, this makes, so the idea of it is that as a result, um, they are more likely to err on the side of not doing anything than err on the side of doing anything. And so it is an inherently conservative um, system that doesn't allow much to happen, if possible. Yeah. We've seen a parallel instance in, Ca in Canada, and Ontario specifically, recently in, in that the uh, provincial government invoked the so-called notwithstanding clause, oh. uh, which overrides the power of the, uh, um, of the judiciary right. uh, uh, as a final say. Right. Uh, and Trudeau pair, Trudeau senior, put that into the uh, Constitution, Canadian Constitution, when he repatriated it. Right. And it was, it was of course, controversial whether that or not that should be. Right. It was just more, you know, more of the long battle between um, the um, the uh, um, the judiciary and <laughs> and uh, and the legislative power. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. We have our own interesting arcane things <laughs> like the notwithstanding clause in the Canadian Constitution, which allow, um, you know, it, it, when it got invoked, it got invoked in a, in, in a way, like you say, that even caused more controversy because it hadn't been used that way before and, it, and people question whether something that's such a crazy emergency constitutional power should be used in, in you know, almost flippantly uh, as opposed to... Um, you know, if there was some serious reason that you'd want to invoke something that nobody's ever invoked before. So in this case, in terms of vetoing, um, uh, vetoes were quite frequent in the Roman system. Karen has a question. I don't know if I'm accurate on this, but uh, I think the difference is that um, uh, the Constitution is Roman and the veto is Roman uh, and Trudeau uh, was looking to the French uh, s civil court as opposed to the English common law, which governed the rest of Canada. Yeah. Um, so he would, that notwithstanding clause uh, comes, I think, directly from the French and civil uh, code side. Uh, yeah, so I guess interpreted very. So yeah, we shouldn't make the sense the, that, that it's yeah. built on the Roman model, but rather just an interesting, weird constitutional quirk that we have, right? Um, that allows a, an unusual thing to happen. And there's a different situation because of the question is, in a way, where is the, where's the sovereign, um, where's, where, where, where is ultimately sovereign? And, that's, and so the question in Canada becomes, um, is it essentially at the provincial level where each provincial parliament is, is more or less sovereign and then therefore the city governments as we're kind of seeing here in Toronto, don't have any power because it's only devolved from the parliament and the parliament can take it back, at least it argues. Um, uh, and simply that also is true, for example, in, in the UK right now. The UK is having this situation where they had a referendum, which is technically the people all deciding that they want to do something, but the people aren't sovereign in Britain, parliament is. <laughs> so in point of fact, actually, the parliament could simply cancel that Brexit thing if it wanted to. It doesn't want to. It doesn't know what it wants to do. <laughs> but, you know, because Britain, and because it's quite established that the parliament has supremacy in the, in the British constitutional system, I think. Um, okay. So anyway, they, there's vetoing. <laughs> so, okay. So we're back to the structure here and we'll look at it. <laughs> So we kind of have seen that essentially we have, I've, we've gone through these assemblies, tribal and centuriate. We've gone through this uh, advisory body of the nobles that's very, very important in terms of day-to-day -day ruling. Uh, the legislation happening down here, but when brought and organized and led by the municipal, uh, you know, the, these authorities, the consuls and the praetors. And then meanwhile, we have these other officials, aedils and quaestors. And so we're going to get to the, um, the next side over there, which is to say the Plebeian Assembly and the Plebeian Tribunes and Aedils. And those are, um, in terms of the question about how is it all evolving, these are all emerging in the first uh, century or so of the Roman Republic. But the Plebeian Assembly and the Tribunes and Aedils are coming after. Um, these other ones will have already existed. And so... What, the question? How many people together in the Republic, Roman Republic? So the question is how many people were in the Roman Republic altogether? And so it's wildly growing. 
So in terms of the um, in terms of the population of the city of Rome by the end, it, it's in the hundreds of thousands of people. Um, I, a lot of times people like to say like Rome is one of these ancient cities that gets to a million people. Uh, it won't have been that size, and, it, and I probably I think those are almost always overblown when people are trying to say that. But anyway, in the hundreds of thousands, it would have been just in the. Um, tens of thousands when, it, when we're starting at this, at this beginning. Uh, and so it will have grown from quite small to quite, quite big. Uh, and, but even at the end, uh, when, when we have hundreds of thousands of people in the city, uh, the, part, the territory that the um, city is now ruling by the end uh, includes millions of people, uh, but millions of people who ultimately have very little chance of participating in any of these um, systems because you have to be in the city to do it, <laughs> you know. So, so we'll see that as a, one of the problems uh, that occurs over the course of these many centuries. So, as you say, it's growing from very small to very big in the whole course of this. So, the thing, one of the things that's happening in terms of this early evolution, um, there's a very initial fight. It's a patrician uh, revolution, which is to say, the this class of nobles that's quite limited, that's already a senatorial class under the kings. They're the ones that have the initial revolution, and they try to keep all of the power to themselves. And largely, all of these different systems that they're setting up is how to keep any one patrician from lording it over all the rest of them. And so it's a way of power sharing among them. But the patricians as a group are quite happy to prevent anybody else in the city, the plebeians, the majority of the population from sharing in any of the power. Um, but the plebeians um, aren't, aren't on board with that, right? So there's an initial exclusion of the majority of the people in the city, the plebeians from the leading offices, um, which are led exclusively, um, and it led, and, and, sorry, in doing that, while they're excluded, so they're not allowed to be, the plebeians aren't allowed to be consul and praetor. Uh, because of that, um, they found, found essentially their own plebeian assembly, which only plebeians can come to, so now uh, patricians aren't allowed to go to this, and their own plebeian officers. And so one of these is a plebeian aedil, so those same kind of aedils that were um, uh, doing municipal government and things like that, there are some that are only, you know, there are also aedils that can only come from the plebeian, plebeian ranks, uh, but much more important are, uh, is an officer called the tribune of the plebs, and if you've heard of tribunes, or like, for example, the word tribune as a, a, a name for a newspaper, it's coming from this particular office, which is, which is one of the more important offices then um, of the Roman Republic, because ultimately the um, plebeian assembly is able to win the right to enact laws, and those are called plebiscites. And we still use the word plebiscite when a lot of times we use it for as a synonym for referendum, but essentially it means when all of the hoi polloi, everybody gets to vote on something like Brexit, <laughs> you know, as opposed to the, um, uh, the legislature. Uh, and then the um, plebiscite, and then the, uh, more importantly even than that, although that's actually super important, uh, so in other words, being able to enact legislation without having, that is binding, without having uh, to worry about what the patricians say, but then two, uh, the office of the uh, tribune, which is able to veto any of the assemblies. So the tribunes of the plebs now can go to the centuriate assembly or the tribal assembly and veto it for a meeting or veto it from enacting legislation. And they can also do that to the Senate. So it becomes, as you can imagine, quite a powerful and controversial office. So we mentioned then that the initially here, oh, you have a question, Karen? Yeah. yeah. How does this differ from the Greek, uh, Erjan's earlier yeah. uh, question? Because my very basic understanding of the Greek is that um, s neither slaves nor women were allowed to vote. And of course, there's, right. there's no women in any of these That's structures. Right. Um, but the people who were basically patricians and free people, uh, they were all allowed to vote, and it wasn't necessarily uh, stratified. So that's very different right. from this, right? So this is different from that. What you're talking about is at Athenian, the Athenian city-state. So in Athens, when it's a democracy, then like you say, women are excluded from the franchise. Um, 
uh, slaves and some of the very poorest people are excluded from the franchise. And so that's actually a huge proportion of the population of Athens. And yet, nevertheless, there is a big proportion of people down to cobbler or whatever that is, a, or, you know, is able to vote. Uh, in, and so that is more extensive, and like you say, it's a relatively equal footing, at least in the Athenian democracy. We'll mention that plenty of other Greek city-states um, have different levels of mixed constitutions. You know, so some of them are kings, where the king or the tyrant has absolute control. Some of them are oligarchies, where you only have a senate or a patrician class that's in charge of everything, and there's no class doing this. This is a mixed constitution where um, it's not a democracy like Athens has. It's not an oligarchy entirely, but it's a oligarchy heavy with increasing um, levels of participation from this plebeian class, which is everybody who owns a little bit of property. So the plebeian class is just to say all men who are able, uh, you know, able to um, purchase enough, uh, have enough property to purchase their own weapons so that they can be in the army. And so that's where you then are in this assembly as a plebeian. You're not part of the patrician class, which is to say the people that have been born nobles uh, uh, back to the time of the kings. So when that monarchy is initially, um, it's initially a revolt of the patricians, and they es essentially establish then that oligarchy, which is to say rule of the noble class, um, the ordinary citizens, the plebeians, begin to agitate for a share of the political power in this new republic fairly early, and that causes much of the internal strife of the first couple centuries, and in, in fact, and it's the evolution of, um, of out of that fighting that's what gets to the main system that as I made that chart. And so not all those things are there at the beginning, but they're all there kind of by the middle uh, of this time period. So as um, uh, time kind of goes on, uh, a bunch of the plebeians are way richer than other ones. You can imagine if it's simply a difference between um, people who are born noble and then just everybody else who has a little bit of money. At a certain point, like rich merchants or any other number of different things, uh, those guys can become very, very rich, even as rich or, or richer than the nobles, uh, but they still don't get to be a noble because they weren't born a noble, right? So a new class emerges that the Romans call equites, and we translate that as knights, but it makes people think of medieval knights. <laughs> so anyway, the only reason, the idea of it is though, is that it's guys who are wealthy enough that they can buy a horse and that they can, um, you know, they can be part of the cavalry. <laughs> and so, uh, so they have all the horse weapons and everything like that. And so then that becomes a new class. They're still plebeians, but they have an, uh, an intermediate level of respect um, as a result of that. And so <coughs> that's um, essentially as that's happening. But as you can see, because the whole foundation here of the Roman state is, is military and the, the, essentially the public thing uh, is about essentially getting military, you know, you're voting together in those centuries, right? So because uh, the state is, needs you to be in the military if you're a man of fighting age and money, um, then we have to also listen to you, uh, which you wouldn't have had to do earlier before this level of fighting had evolved. Yeah, Valerie. Oh, I take it that the patricians, being elite, were also very wealthy. But what about what we would call the bourgeoisie or the trading class, the mercantile class? Yeah. Surely there were such, and surely among them there were rising wealthy people. Could they break into the patrician class, or was it strictly hereditary? I mean, if you're yeah. a wealthy trader who's doing trade with, gosh, I don't know, China or something, what they did in those days, um, and you know, amassed an enormous wealth, did that give you a leg up? So you, so the yeah. So the question is, what about all of these nouveau riche guys? You know, and so that's they're plebs, and the rich ones become equites, and so essentially that's where they got, and they can't become. So as a, so it's a highly um, patriarchal uh, family system, right? So no matter what, your sons aren't ever going to become, you know, patricians. You know, as a result of that, you're always going to be a pleb. Because you have to, in order to be a patrician, you have to be, you know, a Julius. You have to be a, a Claudius. You have to be, you know, a Sopronius. You know, there's only there's only so many of these founding families, um, and and so you can marry maybe one. If you get really rich, you can buy one of their daughters, you know, or something like that, and be kind of like in a related family. Or it may well be that um, 
they will buy one of your daughters. I mean, I'm sorry, you'll sell them one of your daughters. You, know, you give them a lot of money to take one of your daughters. So, uh, you know, however you want to do it in order to have a, um, and that way your children would be nobles because of, or grandchildren, but, but by way of the daughter, right? Because it, it's, it's quite stratified in terms of those two things. So this emerges because there is that um, dotted line here, ceiling here. It's not a glass ceiling. It's a firm ceiling. <laughs> they can't get out. What? The caste system that it's a cast. Yeah, it's a cast. You can't get past it. There's just two ca casts. <laughs> so I mean, there's below this. There's slave, and you got you know they're they're not involved, right? So and then people um, non propertyed free people. So they have those too. So below you know so you have those below. Okay, so back to this <laughs> uh, structure. Just kind of see where we're at. So we have now we can kind of see we have the plebeian assembly in addition to the other assemblies. All of these assemblies are where we can do legislation. Uh, we have the, um, the, uh, the, the consuls and, um, and praetors that are, are able to lead the assemblies and pass legislation. The tribunes also then also have that power and they also have that veto power. And so there's a lot of capacity to veto everything. Okay, we haven't mentioned some of these irregular officers, right? So over there are the censors and over here the dictator. So there are two censors, and ultimately the censors become the most respected official in the republic. So if you um, are a grand old man, uh, getting elected censor is the way to have that capstone on your career. Uh, it is not elected uh, every year, but only every, every four or five years irregularly. The Centurion Assembly elects two censors. They're drawn then from these highly respected former consuls. So you had to have already been a consul. One of your jobs, as you can imagine, is to conduct a census. <laughs> and so censuses are always important because you need to um, know who's around and how much money they have so you can tax them. <laughs> you know, that's what everybody always needs. Uh, but they also have the ability to update the Senate roles. And so they can find out, oh, so-and-so, you should be in the Senate. And you know, you, you, your ancestors are, are right, you should be, definitely be in the Senate, but um, you hadn't been able to before because you didn't have any money, but now you've married the daughter of that really rich merchant woman, that, uh, merchant that you talked about, and so now you have all this money and you can um, you know, pay the money <laughs> and now you're in the Senate. Or let's say you've fallen on hard times or you're, and we don't like you, they can strike you from the Senate role and kick you out. And so they're essentially controlling who's in there. Uh, and then they are also charged with supervising the morals of the society. <laughs> and so that's another way where we get our modern um, use of the word censor. <laughs> Uh, uh, and so censorious. censorious and all that kind of thing. Uh, so a very famous um, censor that I mentioned already, Cato the Elder, I mentioned him in terms of waiting in line to get his uh, free grain that he was owed as a Roman citizen. Um, you can imagine, just look at that face. <laughs> anyway, he's stern moralist. Is that a real, real statue of him? It's a real statue that has been um, that people assigned to him. I don't think that it's known that that is him. I think it's a, it's a real statue. Romans liked, as opposed to, and this is another difference between the Greeks, Romans really liked to have very authentic, you know, realistic um, portraiture. So as opposed to Greeks who are very idealized and they all look like Apollo, uh, even when the, obviously the real guy didn't, <laughs> you know, you know in the, uh, in the, for the Romans, you get to see like, you know, what they look like. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> yep. So here's the kind of thing that Cato would say. Wise men profit more from fools than fools from wise men, for the wise men shun the mistakes of fools, but the fools do not imitate the successes of the wise. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> he also had, um, he had a bunch of really horrible quotes about women that I, <laughs> I didn't include, <laughs> very sexist. And, uh, and he's very famous uh, for uh, constantly repeating in the Senate uh, the phrase, Cartago delendum est, or delendum est Cartago, right? And do you know what that is? Yeah. yeah. Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage must be destroyed. And it was. Yeah, and so he was able to, through his constant pestering, um, you know, uh, essentially get the Third Punic War going. Carthage was already completely a destroyed power, but um, the Romans had a final battle and destroyed the city of Carthage and made it an, rebuilt it as an occupied um, city, a Roman colony. What was the saying again? Cartago de Lindemest, de Cartago. So it's a, anyway, something, you, you have to, Carthage must be destroyed. Must be deleted. 
Yeah, <laughs> must be deleted. Okay, so one of the other irregular officers that was on there that we've been mentioned all the way at the beginning of this was the dictator. So in the case of an emergency, so the, the Gauls have uh, you know, crossed the Alps and are running down to the city and they're at, about to uh, kill everybody, um, the Senate can, under those circumstances, appoint uh, a guy to be dictator. <laughs> And so um, this is a temporary concentration of power. So as opposed to uh, having two consuls that are vetoing each other, uh, the dictator is in charge of defending us and saving us from the Gauls. Uh, and so when they do that, then that person is given command over the whole military and they have very sweeping powers and they can do just about anything they want, um, except for the fact that their term is limited. It can only be for six months. And also the Senate retains the power to collectively veto the guy. Uh, and so, so there is anyway an, a, a sense of flexibility in the Constitution when there is a crisis and you need fast action instead of all of this slow moving vetoing that keeps happening. Um, now uh, uh, we can do that when we have a dictator. And obviously um, the term dictator has uh, moved on <laughs> from when this original, it's, it's original use. It just means the person who's uh, you know, say, say, you know, saying things. Okay. I think Cincinnatus was one of the really famous, yes, yes, there he is. Yeah, he, w he is supposed to have been uh, called upon while he was at his, pl at his plow on yep. his farm, he took control of the army, uh, defeated the enemy, whoever it was, <laughs> and went right back to his plow. And so um, some of the founding fathers of the United States called themselves the Cincinnati. That's right. Hence the city name. Precisely. So yeah, the model dictator, according to legend, um, is uh, very early on in the Republic, this guy, Cincinnatus, and exactly as Elizabeth said the story, essentially some rebels and, uh, had taken control of the capital, uh, the Capitoline Hill, literally the capital, <laughs> uh, in Rome, and they had a mercenary army of Sabines with them, and so uh, they went and they, the Senate had an emergency meeting, they elected Cincinnatus uh, dictator, they went and found him, plowing in the field. He goes and he enacts everything that needs to be done. He destro destroys the rebels and the Sabines and everything like that. And having done that, he d does what a good Roman magistrate should do is he goes right back to plowing, right? So in other words, he would not uh, want to you know, uh, keep power concentrated in his hands. He used the power when it was necessary and that's the model. And as Elizabeth said then, um, George Washington took that as um, Anyway, his, his kind of exemplar of, of setting that kind of an example. Uh, and so Cincinnati, Ohio is named after that order of Cincinnatus, that example that George Washington was running from, which is to say, or was trying to emulate, which is after he served as president two terms, they wanted to make him king or, and have him continually be reelected or something like that. He said, no, I've done what I need. I'm gonna go back to Mount Vernon. I'm going to you know, be a farmer again, and that's, and that's I'm done. Uh, and, and that set a pattern then of um, continual changes of power um, you know, between US presidents. And so another person who um, did a magnificent job of that is Nelson Mandela, who in all these precedents in African um, states where the, uh, the president, once they're in, won't leave and there's no transfers of power. Uh, Mandela didn't transfer to an opposing, par opposing party, but again, he stepped down in that same, um, that same way that Washington did. Yeah, Rudy. Also, Julius Nerrera. Nerrera. Just example. an observation that he lived 89 years uh, approximately, which is quite a lot. Good oh, yeah, good long, long time. good long time. According to, anyway, those are both circas. <laughs> He's a legendary guy, <laughs> too. <laughs> you know, we should also know. <laughs> okay. So. What we have then, you know, is kind of as we're getting to summing up here, there's a system of, or not summing up, but anyway, we're getting to the point where we have that system now, right? There's a system of separation of powers, there's limitations on power, there's a lot of vetoing going on, but there's flexible emergency powers in a crisis, so what goes wrong? Why, why doesn't the system uh, endure forever? Um, we've seen that some of those evolution or whatever is happening in that very first time period, which is essentially this is the time period um, when the, that, that tribunate of the plebs occurs, which is quite early on. But it takes all the way till then before the first plebeian is actually able to be a consul. So this is essentially that, 
that long time period of when there's a plebeian patrician fight. After that, the plebeians, even though they are still plebeians, they're able to be in the Senate, they're able to be consuls and everything else. And so it's, not, it's much less about that uh, thereafter, um, although it's still, you still have the elite elite when you're from the really old uh, family. But then we could, uh, move on to these later constitutional crises that we mentioned before, things like the Gracchi, Marius and Sulla, and the Triumvirates. So, the Gracchi, you can see all the way down here to the second century. Um, one of the things that happened in the course of those many centuries uh, was a, a very severe rising of in income inequality uh, in the Roman Republic. So the foundation of that Republic, as we mentioned, sort of was this uh, military that is based on that soldier citizen the ideal, the, that small farmer, Cincinnatus, who's out plowing himself and then ultimately can be dictator of the state. Uh, in other words, he is a small farmer, but he also has his own weaponry and is part of the military. As Rome expanded, this class becomes ex increasingly stressed. It's hard to be a small farmer, farmer under any circumstances because there's good years, there's bad years, all that sort of thing. If you constantly have to be at war with the Macedonians, <laughs> or the Numidians or whatever, and you were uh, called away for umpteen seven years at a time, then you can quite easily start losing the farm. Uh, also, as a certain amount, you can imagine with the state and all the levers of the state concentrated in such a way that essentially the elite uh, is, uh, have control over almost everything, <laughs> then they can also set it up in such a way as that they become not only rich, but richer and richer and richer as they control all the state contracts, as the state uh, conquers everywhere, they own all the new land, as they become proconsuls and pro-preters, and they are able to rule all these provinces and siphon off vast amounts of taxes and also contract money and any other number of things, uh, business opportunities that they have out in the provinces, and they become super rich. So, um, the patricians are, and the equites, the knights and the patricians are becoming ever more wealthy. And so there's a guy uh, from this uh, better off plebeian class, Tiberius Gracchus, who tries to restore the small holders through some actually fairly modest land reform. So the state has um, lots and lots of land that it owns. And he essentially just wants to break up those and allow uh, small Roman soldiers essentially to be able to ha be given individual farm holdings, not, not confiscations of uh, vast amounts of property and redistribution or something like that, uh, but already existing state land. The problem is that the state lands are normally uh, leased to giant rich landowners who are leasing them at an, inc an incredibly cheap rate and making just vast profits off of them. Uh, and so as a result of that, yeah, exactly. So as a result of that, there's vast, you know, huge opposition to this. And so enter into um, the, uh, the troubles of how this system works when there's a very serious conflict, right? So Gracchus is elected a tribune of the plebs. Uh, he attempts to pass his reforms by plebiscite, but he's continually vetoed by one other tribune. So another tribune can constantly come up and say, veto, 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 every day. Uh, and, you know, and it's, everyone assumed because he's in the pay, you know, he essentially has to be just bribed by one rich guy, and there's 10 tribunes of the plebs. And so um, Gracchus then is continually stymied by this guy. He ultimately impeaches him, and it goes through this whole thing. But they run, more or less run the clock out on his year, and he's not able to accomplish this very popular program. Everybody's really upset. And so he runs for another year, so which nobody has ever done before. So it's not a written constitution where it says you can't do that, um, but on the other hand, uh, uh, people, you know, you, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, so it's been centuries, nobody's ever done that. And so as a result of that, um, uh, essentially he's assassinated, and that causes, you know, all kinds of riots and breakdown and all this kind of thing. And um, later, um, you know, a couple, half a decade later, his, has a younger brother who um, tries to kind of follow in his footsteps, although with a much more radical um, land reform and distribution. And that guy is, again, run out of town by the elites and probably killed again uh, by that. And so essentially the Gracchi then are remembered as martyrs to um, essentially a popular uh, land reform in defense of the, essentially the the small farmer, the um, like say basic legionnaire, allowing a la basic legionnaire to still be a property owner. So one of the things that's happening here is by the time we're getting to the Gracchi, so the Gracchi 
uh, here are in the second century. So that's already past um, the green area and into the orange, right, as, as, there, as we're getting into this expansion. So you can imagine from a state that has um, a government that is just designed more or less to run a municipality or possibly Latium, you know, um, it is now running a lot more territory uh, than that. Um, and so eliminating the Gracchi then doesn't eliminate the problem. So the successful, very successful General Gaius Marius, who's a new man who is able to get elected consul uh, a record seven times, he is able to, through having his own um, uh, tribunes of the plebs and, and, uh, and uh, doing different legislation, he's able to, on the one hand, remove the property requirement for being a legionnaire. So now suddenly he can recruit vast numbers of people that, uh, who are Roman citizens but who don't have their own little farms. <laughs> And so now he's able to refill uh, Rome's legions as a result of that. But as a result of that, they don't have those legions, when they come home, they're not going to be able to go home to their farm like Cincinnati because none of them have farms. Uh, so now you've created a whole soldier class that comes home essentially to nothing. Uh, and so as a result of that, when they come home, when the general brings them home, the legislation that they um, always want to pass when they're victorious is, I want to take vast amounts of land and break it up, especially maybe in the provinces, and give that to all my veterans so my veterans can be settled in Roman colonies and have farms and things like that. As you can imagine, though, one of the things that happens is that all of those um, soldiers, all of those veterans, are loyal not to the Republic and all those senators who are saying, no, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and, and instead, they're quite loyal to those generals. And so even when those generals retire, they're often able to say, uh, in, in time of trouble, time of trouble for them politically or their faction, they're able to uh, send, you know, call out the boys. <laughs> get, all those old, get all those old boys, all those veterans that we had from my wars that are all settled all around, and you can regather and reform veteran legions quite rapidly that are loyal to the general, not to the state. Valerie. Um. It says there that uh, he, uh, Marius, uh, uh, Gaius Marius uh, uh, successfully removed the property requirement. What were the uh, military conditions at the time that might have made that necessary? Was it because of the yeah. constant expansion of the empire? Yeah, so he's in the middle of, um, they're in the middle of a war uh, in North Africa. Uh, and so um, there's actually several wars. <laughs> They're also fighting wars off in, in Turkey. Um, but, but I think it's particularly this one is a war against the Numidians, who are um, the North African uh, Berber people that have um, really uh, been able to, after the destruction of Carthage in that last Punic War, um, they've been able to grow and be quite powerful. Uh, Rome is, though, trying to keep them down as a client kingdom. And at a certain point, they decide to, um, to kill the local king and make it a province. And so um, the king. Uh, and this is the Jugurthian War, so the King Jugurtha of Numidia ends up being a really good general and stuff like that, and so they're humiliated a couple times, and so they need more troops. And so at a certain point, um, uh, he, you know, they just need more troops, and so they're able to get that through, and he's a very popular general. So. And so the patricians, of course, um, argue from then on that he essentially gets... Uh, just the lowest class of people, the thieves and robbers and drunkards or whatever, into the army and that they therefore become a rabble, an armed, uh, armed gang. Um, that, there isn't necessarily a lot of um, evidence for that, but essentially it changed the character of the army because of then it's no longer small freeholders. So um, Marius reforms are resisted by the conservatives in the Senate. Um, it leads to very serious faction fighting, faction fighting that ultimately uh, breaks into civil wars. So at a certain point, um, uh, Marius gets kicked out. He comes back with his uh, army of veterans and is able to take the city by force. Uh, when he does that, he you know, uh, writes up revenge lists. This is when he's kind of old and feeble and, and probably losing it dementia-wise or whatever. But what ends up happening is it gets, creates a bad precedent where you essentially write your um, uh, the prescription. You write your enemy's name on a list. Whoever, whoever's on the list, that person gets killed, and the state takes all the property. So it's a great way for the state to make all this money. It creates a bunch of instability and unending civil war and blood feuds, though. And so Marius then dies. His, um, his 
lieutenants are in charge of the state. At a certain point, the leader of the other faction, Sulla, makes his way back from the war he's been having against King Mithridates uh, off in Pontus, off in Turkey. And so he comes back, and what's now Turkey was then called Anatolia. Um, he comes back and he defeats the, uh, the Marians that are there, and he makes his own prescription lists, <laughs> you know, refills his coffers and that kind of thing. And so it goes kind of in that particular way. And so at that point then, though, while um, one of the things that happens is it doesn't actually, it, it's, it makes the city less governable and it makes the, it, the city itself and the republic unstable. It doesn't particularly, um, uh, it isn't particularly bad for the Romans in terms of how well they're able to beat up all of their neighbors because in fact, the way the generals are competing against each other is by going out and conquering stuff. <laughs> Uh, getting a lot of loot, coming back with veteran armies and things like that. And so, in fact, there's actually um, lots of incentive to just, you know, become a proconsul and go conquer something. And so Caesar, for example, later, you know, he conquers Gaul for no particular reason other than um, he can. <laughs> and it was there, <laughs> you know, it's like, why do you climb Mount Everest? It's there. And also he wanted to essentially be a successful general on the same model and come back with veteran legions and, and that kind of thing. And so his rivals, um, uh, Pompey, is, uh, Pompey the Great is off uh, conquering Syria for no reason. <laughs> so they do that too. So, they, and so essentially they're, they're, that, the Romans are at that point then expanding uh, because of the generals are competing against each other in a way. So we're now to the very end time there of the Republic. So after Marius and Sulla, we're seeing where it's saying they're triumvirates. And so the triumvirates include um, Crassus and Caesar and uh, Pompey, uh, and then from there, then to we're going to see to the unraveling of that. So I have on 44 the assassination of Caesar. So um, no solution um, continue, emerged as Rome's dominion continues to expand. So uh, the same crisis of having legions that are loyal to overpowerful generals, which I'm reminding you again that that word imperatores, emperor, is actually just Latin for general still at this time period. Um, those generals then are opposed, um, uh, they're loyal to the generals as opposed to the Republic, continue then in these next generations and the fights between people like Pompey and Caesar. Um, in 44, after Caesar had seemingly won all those civil wars, uh, there's a senatorial conspiracy and Marcus Junius Brutus, remembering himself seven centuries you know, afterwards as being, again, this elite patrician family of the Brutus family. So therefore it's of his, on his shoulders to defeat tyrants. And so he assassinates uh, Caesar, imagining that everybody's gonna be super excited that the tyrant is defeated and that the Republic will just simply be reformed. They didn't even have a next plan for the next day. <laughs> this seems crazy in retrospect because in fact, the Repu it's already way too late for that. The Republic doesn't have any way to function and recover from that. Uh, and so ultimately uh, Brutus and the senatorials kind of run off and Caesar's heirs uh, hunt them down and uh, kill them. So Caesar's heirs then defeat the senatorial faction and the resulting civil war. Then they then turn, turn on each other. So Mark Antony and uh, Octavian, Caesar's nephew, uh, his, you know, essentially his lieutenant and his nephew uh, fight another civil war against each other. Ultimately then it's Caesar's nephew Octavian uh, who wins, defeats Antony. Uh, he becomes essentially king, but not in name. So he definitely doesn't take that title, Rex. Um, his uncle, Julius Caesar, had kind of flirted with it, and that flirtation was one of the things that got him killed. So functionally then, Octavian, uh, who ultimately named, changes his name to Imperator Caesar Augustus, um, ends the Republic, but he pretends to restore it and continue all its functions then, which last as long as the Empire in the West, and even way beyond it. So all of the um, forms of the Republic are preserved, but the reality is ended as now all power is forever concentrated in, uh, in, the, one, in the one man, the Emperor. So <laughs> that's the end of the Republic as a actual functioning um, constitutional state. Uh, unresolved though in, in that whole of it was the institutions, although they were able to evolve in the course of the whole patrician Publian um, problem, didn't quite ever quite work out, but at least it had uh, reacted in that way. The Republic failed to evolve um, as it um, had this increasing dominion over the entire uh, Mediterranean basin. So there was never um, a way for 
people, even elite peoples of the East, of Alexandria or somewhere, to come to Rome and participate um, in this in the a centuriate assembly or something like that. Um, it's still essentially a city-state that is running now an entire um, what becomes an empire. So that's a problem in terms of an unresolved part problem in the crisis. Okay, <laughs> let's get to the U.S. system just briefly to conclude. So. Um, I wanted to just show it was kind of an example of how that happened in Rome and how it unraveled in the Roman Republic. Um, again, the model very consciously when the US founding fathers, they were going back to looking at how the um, Roman Republic worked. They looked at Athenian democracy and they felt that that was too unstable. Um, they were trying to reject constitutional monarchy, uh, the parliamentary system, and they looked at the Roman Republican system and said, hmm. Uh, they created things like a Senate, you know, and they uh, uh, used symbols like Fasces, and they were very, very interesting. Well, they create, they used, um, they create, re revived powers like veto, uh, and they um, very uh, consciously created a system of separation of powers and checks and balances. And so, obviously, there's three branches of government: executive, judicial, legislative. The idea of it is, is that Congress then, the legislative section, makes the law; the judicial interprets the law; the executive carries out the law, um, but each one of them in theory has a check on the other, so the executive is actually the ones who appoints the judges and also can uh, you know, dangle pardons, if <laughs> in Trump's case, in pardoning individuals. Um, the Supreme Court can declare executive actions unconstitutional. The Supreme Court can declare laws unconstitutional. Um, meanwhile, the Congress is uh, able to for example, create the lower courts, impeaching and removing judges. Uh, it can propose amendments to overrule judicial decisions. In other words, it has different ways that it can, and it also has to approve the appointments of federal judges, so it has different checks on the judicial system. Um, uh, the executive has all kinds of different uh, checks on the Congress. So for example, the power of veto, calling special sessions, making appointments to federal posts, um, and of course, then the Congress, in theory, has all kinds of checks on the executive branch, uh, oversight, being able to issue subpoenas, being able to have uh, federal officials have to uh, come and testify before them. Uh, it has, theoretically, the sole power to declare war uh, constitutionally. It has, for example, the power of the purse, so you can't theoretically appropriate money unless maybe you declare an emergency and say you can. Yes, of course, <laughs> so. the last time it declared war was de de what, December 7th, 1941. Yeah, so it hasn't been using it. In fact, it turns well, out that declaring war isn't actually a very popular power. <laughs> you know, yeah, in some cases it's funner to have the <laughs> Apparently they don't need it. The yeah. United States can fight as many wars as it likes without declaring it. Apparently so. And technically they can impeach and remove the president, right? So that's one of the um, checks and balances. Okay, <laughs> but what happens when the executive illegally refuses congressional oversight? <laughs> yeah. That's the attorney general who just won't show up to, you know, he won't fulfill a subpoena, uh, even though uh, legally he has to, or the treasury secretary who legally has to turn over tax reforms, tax, tax forms, because the law says you, ha you must, but says, well, you won't. So what do you do under those circumstances? Um, well, also, what happens when, um, contrary to a normal, uh, uh, what you'd imagine constitutionally is supposed to happen, which is that Congress people are elected to represent uh, people, Instead now, it's been turned around through gerrymandering, so the Congress uh, people are able to draw the districts mathematically around their voters so that they can choose which voters they want to elect them so that they never lose. Or, thinking back to that Roman example of the unraveling of the state because of the backbone, the small freeholder who was in the military, which was the Roman state, uh, the Roman Republic, to what extent does this crazy income inequality uh, in the United States begin to undermine the Republic, right? So from, this is just 1970, so since I was born, um, the bottom one, sorry, the top 1% of the population in terms of, the, of owning uh, property, the top property class owned uh, about 9% of all of the wealth in the United States, which is you know, still a lot for the top 1% only to own. Now they own about 25, or sorry, 22% of all the property, just 1% of the people. Whereas the bottom 20%, as recently as 1970, uh, I'm sorry, the bottom 
50%, sorry, the bottom 50%, <laughs> half the people, they own still 20% of the property uh, in the country as recently as 1970, and now it's down to only um, 10%. <laughs> so anyway, it's just rapidly unraveling, and that's half the people, right, in the whole country. So, also one result, just like that thing, <laughs> I think with the, um, uh, having developed an empire that was around a city-state, um, having an empire, a global empire, security empire anyway, around a country um, is, has technically had some kind, had certain levels of problems. So on the one hand, there is this whatever security umbrella and things like that, and in some senses there has been, there's never, there's been wars on the level of what World War II has been anyway, and so there's a big difference between the wars that have been since World War II and, and after because of this empire. Um, nevertheless, you know, when you start, I, this is kind of an interesting map, but essentially everywhere that's red is a place that has bases that have over a thousand U.S. troops in them, right? Which is a lot of the, of the planet. Um, the, there's other troops in the yellow areas. There's uh, drone, drone launch pads in the, these ones, drone getting attacked in those ones, um, you know, nuclear umbrella in the blue and this kind of a thing. So anyway, the, the, there, is, it, there is an empire that extends well beyond where anybody's voting. Um, nobody here, in, most people here who aren't, anyway, anybody here in Canada who's not a U.S. citizen um, is not getting to vote, you know, in U.S. elections, even though obviously um, it's affecting the overall uh, defense um, character of, of the world, right? So in that same way, uh, it was only the, the civic people that are actually in the city of Rome that were having any kind of responsive effect uh, on the whole empire of the Mediterranean that was being governed when the Republic. So, so to what extent, <laughs> you know, will history repeat itself? And we'll just leave that as an open-ended question for you guys to ponder and for everybody to ponder online as we say, Roman Republic's fall and the USA. <laughs> who was it who said that? <laughs> who was it? Uh, was Marx? No. Maybe it was Groucho Marx. Somebody said that history doesn't always repeat itself, but it often rhymes. It often <laughs> rhymes. Yeah, it's a good way to say it, yeah. So it's not that it's a circle, but rather there are things, though, the trends as they come back, and there are, like you say, rhymes. <laughs> I have a comment. Okay. Um, James Steidel just comments that. Hi, James. Yeah. Uh, the last USA declaration of war was not in December 1941. It was the 5th of June of 1942 against Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. <laughs> oh, wow. So Congress has, didn't abrogate its power until a whole year later because it wanted to uh, make sure it, it uh, had constitutional authority to attack those Bulgarians. So thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. <laughs> nice correction. I have uh, another comment also from Becky Savage. What? from uh, Lee Summit, Missouri, uh, that she wants to share that uh, Kansas City area uh, is experiencing catastrophic tornadoes as we you know, uh, are watching this lecture. Oh. Uh, so for over one hour from Lawrence, Kansas, now headed uh, towards the airport, estimated uh, winds of 160 miles per hour. Uh, wipes wiped of, off foundations, so prayers appreciated, oh uh, says Becky. Very sorry to hear that, Becky. I'm sorry to hear that for everybody who's in that area. And yes, we'll definitely be uh, thinking and praying for you all. Other comments or questions? I kind of filibustered you guys. Oh, <laughs> Eugene. <laughs> so so in, the, in the period that you described pretty extensively with the uh, earlier Roman uh, Republic, even though we had the various levels of patricians and publicans and so forth, uh, was there any voting and majority rule as such, or was everything vetoable? So, um, so the way that <laughs> it's yeah, it's not majority rule. So there was, but you would have those. You know, we had the, essentially the, the you had those assemblies, right? And so the assemblies are are both the leg legislative and the judicial. Component and so the Senate, as I said, was not actually passing any legislation. So all Roman law is emerging out of either the um, the plebeian, the tri tribal, or the centuriate assemblies. And if you are on all of those cases, those are all open to anybody who is of the any man who's of the property class and the right age, right? And so they are able to come and sit there. But it's not 
by majority um, rule because um, there's all kinds of weird um, things that are affecting how the voting works. So in the tribal assembly, there's the num- 26 tribes or whatever it is, and it may well be at a certain point as they expanded the franchise and they started having all of these allies from all around um, Rome. So you're not a Roman, you're, you're a Samite or something like that. And you are now a Roman citizen. You can come in and you're part of a tribe, but they assigned all those people to just four of the tribes. <laughs> And so then you, so your votes are only getting counted essentially in those tribes. Likewise, um, in terms of the centuriate assembly, um, you could be, in a, you're in like, let's say that you're the poorest person in, that is allowed to vote. Well, you're in the very last um, cent- century. And so what ends up happening is that once, once it gets to 97 centuries that are in favor of one thing or against one thing, then the voting really doesn't matter anymore. And it's like the poor people in Hawaii who it never counts. <laughs> you know, because what ends up happening is, is that everybody's already voted and the vote's decided by the time, certainly by the time California's votes or elect, electors are figured out often before that. Uh, and so then in Hawaii, you're just kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so anyway, so that would be true for almost the bulk of the population in the, in the tribal assembly. And then there's a whole bunch of the people who, of course, don't get to vote. And we should always point out, all women, of course, uh, and then of course, then beyond, be, beyond the the pro- if you don't meet the property requirement, you can still be a free person who still is totally disenfranchised, uh, and then there's a vast proportion of the society in antiquity that's enslaved, and we're going to have a, um, a lecture on 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 ancient slavery uh, in a month or so. So, yeah, Valerie. Somebody was just raising this issue of you know if there's. So there are so many uh, uh, um, divisions of government that can veto each other. You know, sort yeah. of happens. It would seem that in the best case scenario, you know, it's, and I think there was a parallel with the with the U.S. during certain periods, is that it leads to a lot of horse trading and compromise. So that's in the best sense. Yes. Um, in the not so good sense, it can lead to a lot of lobbying, including but powerful and wealthy interest groups. Yes. But in the worst case scenario, it leads to the kind of polarization I think we're really seeing now. Yes. You know, with entrenched positions and no compromise and ultimately even the Civil War, as has indeed happened in the U.S. Yes. Yeah, and so, I mean, I was, there was a wonderful essay in um, The Atlantic, I think, today, uh, that was by um, Obama's uh, head of fa- former head of uh, faith-based initiatives or something like that. So presumably, therefore, a progressive Christian minister or something like that, probably what it was. And so... Um, uh, that person is talking about how in the current um, uh, uh, abortion war in the United States, the two sides aren't interested in any kind of um, legislation. Uh, this, so like, for example, this Alabama law, it's not about any kind of compromise at all. It's about, you know, trying to, you know, really score points because you have total contempt for the other side and you want to, and the, you know, as it's even going through the Alabama legislature, they don't even... They won't even like follow like a procedure, even though they could, you know. So they just gavel it down, and they won't even listen, and they just totally ignore it because of the contempt you even have for your opponent. And so, as you say, the situation at this point does seem to be that the polarization is such that the um, the sides have so much contempt for each other that they're not actually interested in um, legislated legislation, but rather victory. <laughs> so. There's an old quote from. Uh John Steinbeck, in the 30s, he was asked uh, why he thought socialism had never taken hold in the United States of America. And he said that in America, poor people do not regard themselves as members of a downtrodden proletariat, but as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Yeah. (laughs) Right? And I can kind of see that with so much inequality and they can't get it together to fight it. And then there is the huge expense and drain on the country of running and holding on to an empire. Yeah. And you can't help but think that's what happened to Rome. Well, obviously it did. They, they, They started uh, drawing their soldiers. That's right. The legionnaires, they, were, they weren't Romans. They were from other countries. Right. And they were mercenaries. Right. Guess what's happening in the United States now? Yeah, well, we'll have to, um, 
Do you know about the fall of the Roman Empire? <laughs> Which, as you say, has got a different end story, in term, but for other reasons. But yeah, so um, it's, it's a problem. And I think that this, this, this attitude that uh, does seem to exist in the United States of uh, people who are uh, not, you know, whatever, who are in the 50% we saw on the graph, people who have uh, the bottom 50% of the uh, uh, people in terms of how much wealth that they have, a huge proportion of them, like you say, think of themselves as temporarily um, embarrassed millionaires or that they ha at least have the capacity that maybe they're going to strike it rich in some way from business or something. But in fact, there's now, it's, uh, it's shown that I think the U.S. has substantially less chance of you going up a, um, uh, any of those entire, uh, those, you know, you, it's, yeah, it's much high, quite good, easy to go down. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's, it's essentially, it's hard to go up at all compared to in terms of, uh, uh, it's not a mobile society anymore. And so the, the, uh, the society is actually substantially less mobile. And so there needs to be, um, it would be, I'm in favor of doing things structurally to allow people to have that thing that they believe actually be true. <laughs> so that there would be able to be um, uh, rising based on merit and those sorts of things. But it doesn't uh, apparently, it's not structurally set up that way right now. Valerie. Another curious, not quite parallel, but maybe as Elizabeth said, uh, a rhyme, is that there was um, an attempt to control uh, women's reproduction through punitive measures um, in Rome in the latter days of, of the empire, I do believe, in that um, high-born women were not producing very many babies. Right. And so I think laws were passed to counter that, that they had to produce three children, something like that. I can't remember, I can't remember the details, but there was, there were such laws. And, uh, and that I think was done because it was seen that these women were betraying their class, mm. so to speak. But, now in the U.S. with the alt-right, there are accusations that um, women are betraying their race mm. by not producing babies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I can that that yeah, like you say, that's the kind of a thing that reactionaries will sometimes look at look at demographically. So the 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 reality is that. Um, Again, if you're interested in having different kinds of structural uh, effects, you, you have to also look at things from a um, what actually is effective. <laughs> you know, so if you do want to have, um, uh, let's say, women who are in um, economically more advantaged circumstances, uh, you know, give uh, you know have more children, um, there are ways to do it. There's ways to do it, and, and there's ways to not do it. And so one of the things that people do, like Italy gives like some kind of lottery where you get like thirty thousand dollars or whatever Italian, you know, euros, if you have a, if you if you are a woman who gives a you know birth or something like that, and that doesn't work, you know, because what it does is that people just time when they're going to have their kid to the lottery period, and it doesn't actually increase any number of, of amounts, and so they they try to do all kinds of things like that in Japan. Japan, it's come down to nothing. There's there the, there's demographic collapse of the population. And the reason for it structurally is that women have to do all of the same things that anybody else has to do in a, you know, all, that all the men have to do in the society in terms of all the work and everything like that. But then they are also obliged to do 100% of, you know, all the child rearing and all that kind of thing. And so that causes, um, child, you know, child rearing collapse. When you, if you do things like you do in France, where they, um, they just have like free childcare for all French babies, I mean, it's a, amazing the amount of, um, you know, all the different programs for it, that then they actually produce lots and lots of French babies relative to places like other, other places like Italy or something like that. And so um, you said that look at it in those kind of ways as opposed to, like you say, a reactionary punitive law that women must do this. You know, you set up systems that make it possible at a certain point. If you have no capacity to have, to, you know, all the different things you have to do in life and then have a baby too, and where do, you know, if you have no place that you're able to put the baby for, you know, childcare and that kind of a thing, I mean, that's why you can't have a baby. <laughs> banned abortion, even in cases of, you know, incest yeah. and rape, they're now talking about actually banning contraception. In all yeah. seriousness, it's like I was shocked at that. It's like what? Yeah. Talk, yeah, about, real, talk about reactionary. Real handmade tale states. Yeah. <laughs> so to to extend the uh, parallelism here, um, it seems that the Roman Empire did have, have several hundred years of of still 
existing somewhat as an as a, as an empire then. as an empire yeah. after, after the fall of the republic structure. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, do you or do some of the other people feel that we are in a kind of a parallel situation now that uh, under Trump the uh, <laughs> republic structure is, is crumbling yeah. and then uh, the, uh, the the partisanship and so forth. Uh, but we might be uh, still in a situation of, for several hundred years of uh, <laughs> American dominance in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of places, uh, you know, so yeah, even, and so an empire, for example, also doesn't at a certain point have to uh, become a dictatorship or a, or a monarchy of a, one particular family or something like that or even one particular person. Um, it can be a situation where uh, all of the different power, you, you could still be transferring power, but all the power is being held by an imperial president or something like that. Um, and that's, and so those norms are, are definitely been unraveling and that's been, as more and more power has been concentrated into the, into the president and he's been taking more power. And so those precedents are being established for good or ill, whatever is gonna happen in terms of who's next for a good president or a bad president going forward, we still have additional precedents. Um, in terms of the U.S.'s capacity to maintain dominance, so I was, as a historian, um, you, I'm quite conservative in, in predicting outward because it's very hard to predict anywhere past, like the foreseeable future is at best 40 years for just basic stuff, but so many things are going to happen in 40 years that, that it's very hard to predict. Um, lots and lots of um, factors for the U.S., though, are still amazingly positive in terms of maintaining um, global dominance, including um, total un fairly unchallenged military supremacy. The, um, uh, the different things that China is doing is quite tiny comparatively. The, um, uh, the, 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 the threat of the Chinese economy taking over. China has some very serious uh, structural problems demographically where um, it's, it's grown this big, but all the people are in the working age right now and there's no young people and there's no old people. As soon as all those people are here, um, it's a huge problem. They may well never, the U Chinese economy, even though it's been going like this, it, the line may never cross the U.S. economy because the U.S. also grows because of immigration. China can't start doing that because of, uh, you know, it's already full. Uh, so, it's, you know, it, it, who knows exactly what, what the situation going forward is, but um, there's a lot of still quite reasonable factors for continuing U.S. domination, whether it's an empire or whatever it is. <laughs> Uh, well, going forth. Well, anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, maybe so. <laughs> the elder would say China must fall or be eliminated. <laughs> well, it's a, is China the main, you know, ancient rival? I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know if you'd no, say no, that. No, I mean, that it would be the right. Part right. Even just over your lifetime, uh, American done. The American century is kind of over, uh, if only because a lot of people in a lot of other countries aren't having it anymore. Yeah. And there's only so much you can do with soldiers and weapons. Right. If people say, we refuse to be frightened anymore, we refuse to be dominating anymore, that's it. So we can hope in terms of that, because yes. I mean, there's no reason for, <laughs> anyway, so we'll leave it on the note of hopefully um, something will emerge where everybody in the whole planet doesn't have to live under the threat of constant drone strikes with no response possible, you know, because yeah. anyway, so, all right. Okay, I'm going to be uh, <laughs> the voice of James once again, like he says, uh, I'm, I'm curious how many U U.S. born persons we have here. Right, right here in this right room? Right here. Yeah, yeah. how many? Three. Three. Three in the room. Okay, well, James says that we USA are taught, and let me know if you guys agree, uh, that we can achieve economic success. If we don't, it's our fault or our choice. The attitude is that poor people are poor because they are not willing to make their situation better. Yeah. And based on those ideas, people vote against their own interests. They work hard, and they see people poorer than them as lazy. Yeah. Which I think it's <laughs> true in other countries as well that are based on this mm. Roman Republic model. <laughs> just a Again, I quote somebody, <laughs> this is W.H. Auden, I think in 1954. He said, in some ways, it is harder to be poor in the United States than in Europe, even though poor people in the United States are, or were then, richer than poor people in Europe. And why is this? Because in Europe, if you're poor, 
It's assumed that it's because your parents are p were poor and their parents were poor and so on and so forth. Right. In the United States, it is assumed by you and everybody <laughs> else, if you are poor, it's because you're stupid. Right. Or deserve it in some way. You're lazy. Yeah, right. You deserve yeah. it. Yeah. So and unfortunately, that has stuck. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so if we're going to address those things. <laughs> I would say, I would suggest we yeah, have to look at statistics. We have to look at what works and and make put in place policies that actually you know can show, hey, this gets this results when this does this here, and that should be how it should be done. So, anyway, all right, all right. conclude. Bye bye, guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs>